You are listening to Season 2, Episode 68, Cubs Sweep San Fran of the Fly the W670 podcast. Don't forget to listen, download, review. Most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W670, Twitter, Instagram, and of course on Facebook. Or email Crowley and I at flythew670 at gmail.com. All right, Crowley, you and I thought that a sweep was possible. We felt pretty good about two out of three, but we got our wish. We got all the Cub fans' wish as the Cubs went ahead and swept the Giants, completing it just about an hour ago over at Wrigley Field. It was absolutely amazing. You could hear it through your radio, listening to Pat and Ron. I was at the game uh, last night. It, it's just Wrigley is rocking right now. It's I haven't had those vibes in a long time. Yeah, it looked pretty cool on your uh, social media. I saw a couple of photos that you uh, shared with everybody, and uh, unbelievable when we get into uh, game number two. But let's start out with game number one, and that was quite an unbelievable performance by Justin Steele. Yeah, you know, uh, I got to be honest, Steele versus Webb, I was a little nervous just because, you know, I'm confident with Justin Steele, but remember, you know, he threw 111 pitches last time out, so I was kind of watching that. And then the offense had two good games and two bad games in Cincinnati, so I just didn't want to see another close game and more pressure being put on the bullpen. And unfortunately, for the first seven innings, that's exactly what it looked like. Uh, the Cub jumped out to an early uh, lead in the second when Seiya Suzuki hit a solo home run to center to make it one nothing, but that was it for the Cubs' offense, and Logan Webb looked good. He gave up two hits and a walk through six innings, but then finally the Cubs' offense broke through in the seventh. With Webb still on the mound, Cody Bellinger led off the inning with a single, advanced to second on a Dansby ground out, and scored on a Seiya Suzuki double to make it two to nothing. Heimer Candelario lined out for the second out, but Mr. Clutch, Jan Gomes, singled to score Suzuki to put the Cubs up 3-0. Cubs added a couple more insurance runs in the eighth when Mike Talkman led off with a walk. Tristan Beck's got the next two batters out, but then Cody Bellinger hit one to Giants second baseman Thyro Estrada, who committed an error, kept the inning going, and Dansby Swanson would double to score Talkman and move Bellinger to third. And then Saya would hit one to third baseman Casey Schmidt, but Swanson alertly ran back to second, allowing the run to score and put the Cubs up 5 nothing. I'm not going to complain about the Cubs scoring five runs, but they only had six hits on the day, Dustin. Saya and Jan Gomes accounted for four of those hits. Talkman, Horner, Hap, Candelario, and Magical were all hitmen, uh, hitless. But the good thing is, is that the Cubs took the opportunities they had. They went three for six with runners in scoring. There position. you go, right? It's all about timely hitting, right? It's not always about the number of hits you get, but when you get them, Crowley. And it, obviously, in that case, it did. I, I liked uh, I liked your uh, little nickname there for uh, Jan Gomes. Mr. Clutch, absolutely. Mr. Clutch. And you know what? Five runs was plenty of support for Justin Steele, who probably pitched the best game of his career. Uh, that 111 pitches didn't seem to affect him one bit. He gave up a two-out walk in the first a two-out single in the second, and then the Giants did not have a single base runner until the eighth inning. We talked about the Cubs' bullpen being gas, and Steele gave the Cubs eight shutout innings. He gave up two hits, two walks, and a career-high 12 Ks. Dustin, with that victory, the Cubs matched their 2022 win total with three and a half weeks still left to play. But let's go back to Justin Steele. Justin Steele became the first Cubs since John Lester to reach 16 wins in a season. And you look here and you can see, you know, right now, when you talk about the idea of a Cy Young, he's first in wins. He's second in ERA. He's fifth in opponents OPS. And he's first in home runs per uh, nine innings. He doesn't give up many home runs. About the only thing is, is that, you know, you're looking at the other two guys. Spencer Strider has more strikeouts, which I guess, you know, um, and uh, Ian Snell has a little bit better ERA. But but Justin Steele has to be definitely up there, right? Well, he's in the conversation. And I know we don't talk a ton of gambling on this podcast, but his uh, his odds, he is now the second favorite to uh, win the NL Cy Young Award. I mean, he's doing amazing things. And so... That, that eight innings and shutout innings and 12 Ks in the last 20 years, just two Cubs pitchers have done that beat. Jake Arrieta in 2014 and 2015, that 2015 was a no-hitter. And then Ryan Dempster in 2008, Demp had that great season, helped them get into the uh, NLDS. And the only Cubs left-handed starting pitcher to ever do eight shutout innings and 12 Ks, Ken Holtzman, 1972. 
before we were both alive. So that was a long time ago. Absolutely. So just when your name gets brought up with Lester and Arietta and Ken Holtzman, you're in good company. Absolutely right. So Cubs get it done in game number one, thanks to a little bit of offense and a lot of strikeouts from Justin Steele. That moves us into game number two. You were at the game. Kyle Hendricks started. And as we thought, the Giants went with an opener. Right. Yeah. We talked to Mark Willard. He said, basically they got like two good starting pitchers and then everyone else, they kind of just piecemeal. They started this out with Ryan Walker. Um, the wind was blowing out. So I'm walking to Wrigley and I know right away. I'm like, Oh God, just because I'm not a big fan of Kyle Hendricks plus wind blowing out bad combination. And on the very first pitch of the game before my butt is in the seat, Lamont Wade jr. Crushes one 412 feet and the Cubs were down one, nothing. The Giants had one more run on a J.D.'s Davis single, and he advanced to second on an air by Bellinger in center. It kind of popped out on him uh, when he was picking it up. And then Davis advanced to third on a Brandon Crawford ground out and scored on a flare hit by Wade Meckler that landed just over the outstretched gov of Dansby Swanson to make it 2-0 Giants. Then in the third, Dustin, Mike Yastrzemski hit a wind-aided basket home run that went off my friend Ryan's hand. So I'm going to tell us real quick here. I'm at the game. I'm in the bleachers, first row of the bleachers, and my buddy Ryan is doing his fantasy football draft on his phone. He's doing his <laughs> fantasy football draft, kind of just looking down. All of a sudden, boom, Yastrzemski hits it. And, and for the people that have subscribed to the YouTube channel, I'll describe this photo here. You could see my buddy in the Little League jersey right here with the outstretch. He only has one hand because his other hand's on the phone. You see me looking at him. Where are you two hands? I'm wearing the Fly the W T-shirt. And was then, that Sears? Was that Sears standing behind him? Uh, no, no, no. He Sears had to move to a different section, uh, okay. and so I'm I here. Thought that right, was Sears in that old school jersey with the Chicago and the uh, the one right blue. next to him. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. That's the girl. Yeah. And then this is my Sears favorite too. photo because I was just like, ah, I can't believe that went out there. So a good, <laughs> good fly the W a promo right there. But that there was go. on TV. So thank you for all the listeners that sent that in when they saw that. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And it felt at that point, right? Like the luck wasn't going to be the Cubs way that night. That's how it felt to me sitting at home watching it. Right. And the Cubs started to come back in the third with singles by Nico Bellinger and then Swanson to make it a three to one game. Then Seiya Suzuki would single to load the bases. Giants pitcher Jacob Junis walked Heimer Candelario. So free run. Thank you. Three to two. And again, Mr. Clutch, Jan Gomes, hits one to left. Former Cub Jock Peterson dived to bounce off his glove. Two runs would score. Now the Cubs are on top for three. I felt so much better for a couple of minutes. For a couple, right? And then, you know, top of the six, Hendricks still in the game when Wilmer Flores and Jock Peterson hit back-to-back doubles to tie it up. Hendricks' night was done after striking out the next batter. Now, again, you know, with the wind blowing out, and and again, wind-aided home run, an error on uh, Bellinger, which doesn't normally happen. Hendricks went 5.1 innings and gave up five runs, four of them earned on seven hits with five Ks and no walks. That was more runs than he's given up since August 4th, spanning five starts where he's had a 248 ERA. So in comes Hayden Wesniski, who looked phenomenal against Cincinnati, and I'm all pumped up. With one out and one on the first battery phase, J.D. Davis hits a two-run homer, and the Cubs were down 6-4. And, oh, there was a little bit of, you know, with the wind, you're saying to yourself, you're not out, right? But in the seventh, in the middle of the seventh, old friend, El Toro, Carlos Zambrano, he sings the seventh inning stretch and he demanded, I say demanded, the Cubs get some <laughs> runs. And that is exactly what they did with one out. Dansby Swanson walked. Say Suzuki tied it up with a homer to left. Hamir Candelario doubled. Jan Gohm singled. And Nick Magical reached on a fielder's choice when he grounded to third. And third baseman Casey Schmidt went home with the throw. That scored it away from the catcher. Everybody's safe. And the Cubs lead seven to six. And then... Christopher Morrell, he has a flair for the dramatic. Yes, it's a three-run yes, bomb to center. And Dustin, that looked like it was at the exact same spot that David Bodie hit a grand slam a few years back. And the Cubs are now out 10-6. That was Morrell's 20th home run. So the Cubs now have three hitters with 20-plus home runs. Bellinger added to his total today. He's got 24. Peewiz with 21. And Morrell now with 20. It's never easy as the Giants got a runoff struggling reliever Mark Leiter Jr. and Wilmer Flores homered off Julian Merriweather, but the Cubs were able to close it out with a 10 to 7 victory. The Cubs scored 10 runs on 15 hits. Swanson two for four with an RBI. Gomes three for four with two RBIs. Morrell one for three with a homer. But what about Seiya Suzuki, Dustin? Four for five 
with a homer and three RBIs. Just absolutely incredible. I, I'm just guessing that uh, Seiya Suzuki might be on the hot list this week. Just just maybe. Maybe. I, I, I can't imagine <laughs> can't imagine anybody hotter than him, but we'll find out in a few minutes. Also, Crowley, how about the stat about the Cubs scoring 10-plus runs in games this season 22 times? Yeah, their all-time record is 23. 23 is their all-time record. I think they're second – in baseball just behind the Rangers so far this year. And I think their run differential right now is over a hundred. I think it's one Oh one, the run differential so far this year. Amazing. Right. And, and once again, for another night, they were six for 13 with runners in scoring position. We kind of harp on that stat, but I mean, yep. it's just huge when you can get those runs in and, 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 and not leave them on base. All right. Game number three Cubs going for the sweep Cubs looking to be, 12 games over 500 if they can get this one done. And Jordan Wicks making his Wrigley Field debut as a starter. Yeah, a lot of excitement going on. You, you had Jordan Wicks making his Wrigley debut. And Seiya Suzuki and the Cubs all off. Bottom of the first one out. Nico and Hap single. Cody Bellinger struck out for the second out. Dansby Swanson was able to draw a walk. And here he comes again. Seiya Suzuki doubles to put the Cubs up three to nothing. In the top of the third, Ian Happ and Cody Bellinger hit back-to-back -back doubles, put the Cubs up 4 nothing. Bellinger has driven in 26 runs in the last 19 games. I mean, unreal. Nick Magical drove in Bellinger with an RBI single to extend the Cubs' lead to 5 nothing. And in the fifth, Miguel Amaya hit a solo home run. Christopher Morrell had an RBI single in the sixth. Cody Bellinger hit a home run in the eighth. I mean, this offense was something else. Eight runs, Dustin, on 10 hits. And it was this was a fun one just because a little bit of everybody was kind of getting involved. Everybody kind of had a turn. And, 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 you know, they were four for nine with runners in scoring position. So, almost, again, like batting like 400. With yeah, runners almost, in scoring they're batting almost 500. I mean, oh, my gosh, they're doing fantastic with that stat. Now, there was one little thing that irritated me. And, you know, I've been har harping a lot about not seeing Alexander Canario so mm -hmm. Ross finally puts him in. He who does he put him in against? One of the best closers in the game, Duvall. Yeah, flamethrower. Yeah, he's an absolute flamethrower. Yeah. But I still thought it was a good at bat. But as much fun as the offense was, we got to talk about Jordan Wicks. This is his third victory in a row. The first Cub to do that since 1901 to have victories in his first three starts. He had a quality start. His first quality start. His first Wrigley win. 6.2 innings. Nine hits, two runs, uh, 1K, and zero walks. He's not a big strikeout guy, but he's a guy that lets the defense do the work behind him. And I just – I was really impressed. There was a play where the ball went off him. He's able to throw home and get, and get the runner. I mean, he just seems to have a lot of poise, Dustin. Lots of poise, good personality, f fits right in with this group. Uh, really, really enjoying what I'm seeing so far from Jordan Wicks. And not only that, Dustin, Luke Little made his debut yes. today. He's not so little. No, big boy. Uh, one inning pitch. He <laughs> gave up one hit, but two Ks. Two Ks. So, I mean, just to see, like I said, Jordan Wick's debut, Canario's first at bat, Luke Little's first inning. It was just a lot of fun. But, Dustin, you know, I think about we, – we had a show that we titled The Cubs Are 10 Games Under. And usually that's a death sentence for any team when you're 10 games under 500. And somehow, some way. The Cubs have scratched their way back to now being 12 games over 500. This team 100% believes in itself. And I can tell you by the roars of the crowd all week, the Cub fans believe in this team too. Oh boy, the fans have been fantastic, right? Absolutely. Uh, you, you just, when Canario got the at bat, I was driving, I was listening to Pat and Ron and you could hear it. Pat was letting, you know, Pat being the professional, let's listen to this crowd and, and just, you could just hear it coming through your stereo. It's just unreal. Every time Luke Little struck a guy out, you could just hear it on the broadcast. So it's it's just the fans are so into this. And uh, I think Rossi went out of his way to talk about, you know, schools back in session. It was a Tuesday night and the place was rocking. Yeah. And there was a lot of people that were at the Pearl Jam show at the United Center and it was still rocking. So right. it, was, it was fun. And, and luckily we're getting back to these 640 starts. So I kind of like those a little bit now. Yep, they work out well for people that get up at uh, 2 and 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs>
This is the Fly the W670 podcast. It's season two. It's episode 68. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. In this segment, Crawley interviews Jen Martindale, Senior VP of Marketing for the Cubs, to discuss this weekend's Cubs Hall of Fame festivities. Joining me now on the Fly of the W podcast, we're gl- happy to welcome back Jen Martindale, Senior VP for Marketing for the Chicago Cubs. Jen, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, we just obviously played a hard-fought game against the San Francisco Giants and came out on top, so everyone here is in great spirits. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it's been a fun week. It's, it's been a fun summer, I think, in, at Wrigley Field. The whole, the whole vibe, the whole energy around the ballpark is great, but... I've been, I had this date circled on my calendar since Cubs convention when uh, Tom Ricketts came out and announced that there was two new Cubs entering into the Cubs Hall of Fame, Sean Dunstan and Mark Grace. Oh, I know. We loved that moment. Um, And we're hoping that can become a tradition for us at convention where we start to let you all know who's going to be coming into the next class for the Cubs Hall of Fame. So we will be celebrating Mark Grace and Sean Dunstan all weekend, Friday through Sunday. In 2021, you guys unveiled the Hall of Fame right out, if people aren't aware, right outside of underneath the left field bleachers. Correct. And last year it was uh, Jose Cardinal, Pat Hughes, and uh, Buck O'Neill. And this year you guys are doing things just a little bit different. And I like it because I feel like each of the inductees is kind of getting their own little moment to shine. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the Cubs have such an incredible almost 150 year history and our annual um, Hall of Fame induction is one way that we can bring that history to life for our fans and help the next generation understand, um, you know, this amazing legacy that they're a part of. And typically we've held the Cubs Hall of Fame induction on a particular day, but this year we're going to make a whole weekend out of it starting this Friday. So our 2023 inductees, as you mentioned, um, Mark Grace and Sean Dunstan, will each get a game dedicated to them. Um, Dunstan's uh, dedication day will be Friday and Mark Grace's will be Saturday. And then on Sunday, the actual induction will happen. And that will be, there will be a private ceremony just for them and their families in the morning on Sunday. And then during um, the game on Sunday, before the uh, first inning, we will recognize them on the field formally and welcome them into the Hall of Fame. And then there will be some special moments throughout the game as well to further celebrate them. So is it going to be, say, Sean Dunstan throwing out the first pitch and doing the stretch on Friday and then Grace on Saturday? Actually, they're going to both do it together on Sunday, and we'll have other moments throughout the games on Friday and Saturday that will celebrate them. Now, one thing that did catch my attention is that there's going to be a new pop-up exhibit you know, presented by Marquee Sports Network at Gallagher Way. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. That's really the biggest addition to the Hall of Fame weekend versus years past. And those of you who joined us at Cubs convention last year might have experienced the archive rooms that we had on display. And this is really the next iteration of that idea. So we've essentially created a mini museum on campus on Gallagher Way that will open this weekend. Um, It'll be open for the rest of the season free of charge on game days. And it's going to have a Hall of Fame theme, given what's happening this weekend. But there will be a lot of other historical um, pieces on uh, view as well. So we'll have Pat Hughes Frick Award on view for the first time. We have the crowd pleasers like the 1876 and 1907 championship trophies. We're going to have a lot of items from Grace and Dunstan since we're going to be celebrating them this weekend. And then a lot of other items from our legends, including Ron Santo, Jake Arrieta, Andre Dawson, Billy Williams, Ryan Sandberg, Greg Maddox, um, even some special items of Harry Carey's. So we're going to bring more stuff out of the vault for people to look at. We got a lot of great feedback at convention last year. People saying more of this, please. Like, let's get our history out in front of people and and not leave it in this fire safe bunker. (laughs) Never, you know, never to be enjoyed by the public. So we're trying to to listen to y'all. And where, where would the exhibit be for people that are coming to the to Wrigley Field this weekend? Sure. If you're in Gallagher Way on the line of storefronts where the Cubs store is and the Brick House, right in between that, those two, there's a um, storefront that has a marquee sports network sign over it. It's going to be right in there. 
Okay. And th yeah, there's always a lot of pictures on there and you guys change them out, which is really cool. And so, I mean, I'm, I don't know what to anticipate, but I'm guessing that there's going to be a lot of former Cubs that are probably going to be poking around uh, all weekend long, as far as the teammates of these guys. Cause when you talk about uh, Shawan and you talk about Mark, these are two guys that were just beloved by so many of their teammates. That's right. We're going to definitely have some other legends in the house this weekend that our fans will see around. And some of them might even pop into the exhibit on Gallagher way. So be mindful of that. Oh. Um, and then one thing I'd be remiss uh, not to mention as well is on Sunday, we're going to have a special gate giveaway. It's actually um, a set of commemorative pins, one commemorating um, Dunstan and one commemorating Grace, and they will come as a packaged set for our first 10,000 early arriving fans. Wow. And so, I mean, I mean, when you think about this weekend too, you got the uh, Nike City Connect replica jerseys for the first 10,000 on Friday. Yeah. So not only do you have that, but I mean, if you are a season ticket holder, which I am, you get a uh, photo session with Sean Dunstan, if that's what you chose, yeah. which is going to be really cool. Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot going on for our season ticket holders this weekend. Um, it's a perfect way to start September. We're gonna, then going to obviously roll into some bigger things at the end of the month, including we'll wrap up with Fan Appreciation Weekend for our last homestand in September. And we'll have some fun things planned for season ticket holders and, you know, all fans in general. Yeah, and then on Saturday against the Diamondbacks, a Harry Carey bobblehead statue. I have, uh, you can't really see it from here, but I have all mine lined up over there. I got them all so far. I'm excited. And, you know, Mark Grace is the person that I selected to get my photo with, with my awesome. season ticket rep, which excited to see Mark Grace. And, and, and it's a lot of fun. And then I remember Sunday, the, the nice blue blazers that the guys get. And then they get to, like you said, throw that first pitch, sing the stretch. And yeah. so I, I really think that, you know, compared to last year, because I was there last year as well, I think that this is just so much more exciting and just makes it such a such a festive weekend. I appreciate that. Um, and we are, like I said, we're trying really hard to listen to the fans and make more of this special thing that we have. The Cubs Hall of Fame is a big deal. And it, there was so much we wanted to do that we couldn't do it all in one day. And so we said, you know what, we're just going to start having a Hall of Fame weekend so that we can do more for the fans and celebrate the players more than we'd been able to if we just picked one day to do it. Well, I think the committee did an excellent job. I mean, those are two candidates that really represent, uh, you know, the late 80s, 90s, you know, Cub fan, a guy like me, you know, those were guys that I just were, was rooting on. And, and I think you guys have just made this weekend really fun. And I think for Cub fans, great opportunity to, to really just make a fun weekend out of it. And then if also, if, you know, you're not a season ticket holder, I mean, there are perks that maybe sometimes people aren't aware of. So again, getting those special photo sessions with one of the guys is just one of those perks. So that's why, like I said, I've, I've never given them up. I've been around since 2000 as a season ticket holder. So the fact that you guys still thought of us in this event really kind of makes me happy as well. Oh, I'm going to pass that along to our um, service team. They'll be thrilled to hear that and um, appreciate your loyalty always. Well, Jen, thank you so much for jumping on and taking a little bit of time. It, this weekend is going to be really exciting and I hope to see you around and hopefully we get to see some more uh, flying of the W's. Let's go. All right, Crowley, sounds like a great weekend as usual out at Wrigley Field, and the uh, Cubs are going to be hosting the D-backs. But before we get into previewing that, let's take a quick look at the standings and a couple of notes. Dustin, the Cubs, after Milwaukee lost today, are 1.5 games out of first place. I mean, I just it's unbelievable. Um, the Brewers are kind of coming back to earth. They're 5-5 five and five in their last 10, while the Cubs are 7-3 and three, and now riding a four-game winning streak. Cincinnati is five games back from Milwaukee, Pittsburgh 12.5, and look at St. Louis, still in the basement. But now you, you're really, like I said, between the wild card and the, and the division, the Cubs are right in striking distance. They're right behind Philadelphia, right? They're, they're, right. they're about a game they're back right from there. Philly. They're right there. One game back from Philly, so if they could take first, they would have home field advantage. They have home. Otherwise, there are yeah. no home games. The series do not move. It's all the games are in one spot. So as, as it stands right now, the Cubs would be at the Phillies. Now, Miami, Arizona, who's If I'm understanding Miami, it right. If I'm understanding. I think you are right. And so Miami's about half a game out of the wild card picture. They've gotten hot lately, winning five in a row. Arizona is three out of their last seven. So something to kind of keep an eye out right there. They are one game from the final pop, um, wild card spot. 
And then San Fran just got knocked all the way back there. They're now 2.5 games back on yeah, a six game kind of losing streak. The rear view mirror that I think they're kind of game set and match, as we'd like to say. No doubt about yep. that. That's so the standings are uh, the standings are looking favorable, and they've got what? They've got a bunch of games with the Diamondbacks and a bunch of games with the Rockies coming up. Diamondbacks, Rockies, yeah, a lot. So it's uh, you know when you look at the calendar, it's it's. They couldn't have drawn this up any better. This is just uh, the way that the schedule kind of plays out. You still got, yeah, Arizona, Colorado, Arizona, Pittsburgh, Colorado, Atlanta, Milwaukee. Yeah, well, in some unfortunate news, the Dodgers' Julio Urias is under investigation for violating the league's domestic abuse policy. This is probably the second time he's allegedly uh, gone through this, and he is a potential big free agent that I don't think many teams will want any part of. What a mistake! And, and, you know what? What an awful thing to do! And 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 you know, just God, you, you know, he was he was one someone that when you look at the the potential starting pitchers that were going to be out there, he could have had a good payday, and he screwed it up. So that's on him. Yeah. In some better news, though, Marcus Stroman uh, threw a decent bullpen, and they're waiting to see how he uh, comes out of that. Yeah, so you know when we look at the roster moves in the injury report, Stroman threw a normal bullpen session on Monday. Ross said that Stroman was excited about how he felt. But it's, Ross feels it's still too early to determine if he could come back as a starter or a pen if his arm doesn't get stretched out. Good friend of the podcast, Tommy Perch, broke the news about Luke Little today, so that was great. You were saying the name is ironic, 6'8", 220. He was selected in the fourth round of the 2020 draft. And today is the day Michael Fulmer was eligible to come off the IL. Um, same with Nick Birdie. He's scheduled to picture, pitch with the I Cubs after some uh, irritation in his arm. But uh, I have not heard about Fulmer or anything about that since then. Yeah, I'm hoping that Fulmer's back up for the uh, four-game set against the uh, D-backs. And maybe it's time for Mark Leiter Jr. to have some kind of soreness or something, get a little break. Yeah, You know what, though, Dustin? Let, let, let's, let's look at that. When was the last time that you saw uh, Edward Alzali? was, what, Friday night? Right, right. So is something so, going on there that they're not telling us? Hopefully not. I don't know if they're giving him a little rest or, or if he is uh, somebody that might, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous because I was watching that carefully. All right. We'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep our eye on Twitter as well. All right, Crowley, here we go. Cubs versus Diamondbacks. And uh, Mark Grace is in town for the uh, festivities with the Cubs weekend you talked about earlier. And uh, here come the D-backs who are 74 and 88 uh, last season, but they are sniffing around the wild card situation right now, right? Yeah, they had the exact same record as the Cubs last season. And just like the Cubs, they had a busy offseason. They added catcher Gabriel Moreno. They had left fielder Lourdes Gurriel, Kyle Lewis as outfielder. Chafin, they got Andrew Chafin, who they traded. And then a whole bunch of right-handed pitchers, Scott Magana and Zach Davies and Miguel Castro. You remember Zach Davies with the Cubs? Mm -hmm. And then Evan Longoria is still around. I can't believe that. But they did lose Dalton Varsho and, and Jordan Luplo, but they have a, a lot of outfield, uh, a surplus of talent. And so at the trade deadline, the D-backs were really busy. They got closer Paul Seawald from the Mariners. They got Peter Strasliski from the Brewers. That's who they traded Andrew Chafin to. And then they got outfielders Jace Peterson from the A's. And you remember Tommy Pham from the Cardinals and Mets and all over the place. Um, but the Diamondbacks, like you said, 71 and 67, good for second place in the NL West behind the Dodgers and just ahead of the Giants. They currently hold the last wildcard spot and are three games behind the Cubs that spot but uh they are playing colorado they split the first two games and they are playing right now and the score if i'm taking a look at it arizona 11 colorado 5 so see what happens we'll see what happens they look to be in good shape as they'll uh get into wrigley but again you know advantage cubs right they're getting it's a night game tomorrow but they're going to get into wrigley late yeah and and hopefully they're sluggish and uh they don't even know who's pitching tomorrow. <laughs> right. The old TBD. Well, Crowley, you ready to get into the probables? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, this. what can we say about Javier Assad that hasn't been said? The lifesaver right here, a guy right now, three and two at the 269 ERA against Cincinnati. He did not get the decision. That was not his fault. He went eight innings pitch, gave up seven hits, zero earned runs, seven strikeouts, and one walk. That was the walk-off game, unfortunately. Against Pittsburgh, he did get the win. He went seven innings and only gave up one earned run. And against Detroit on 821, he went 5.1 innings and gave up two earned runs. But he just seems to be getting better and better with every single start. Yep, he's been really good. And you wonder, you know, if there is a postseason in the Cubs' future, um, what his role would be in the, you know, as a starter or a bullpen guy. 
Well, you know, like we said, Arizona is TBD, but if you look at Friday's game, that's where we have Jamison Tyone, and I think that's where your question becomes big. Like, would you mm-hmm. say that Jamison, you can't start as a side as a as a side as a side jump Tyone at this I point? I think you have to today, say that. today I would say yes. Today I would Absolutely. say yes. Absolutely. I, yep. I I don't think that's going to be changing in the next three weeks personally. Um, I mean, and seven it's the and home nine. runs. It's the home runs that that's what's killing me with Tyone right now. It's the amount of home runs he gives up. Oh, it's 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 like BP. I mean, right now he's seven and nine with a five seventy three ERA against Cincinnati. He did not factor in the decision. Five point two innings, gave up five earned runs, seven strikeouts against Milwaukee. He got the loss. Six innings, gave up four earned runs, six strikeouts, and against Detroit, he didn't get a decision. 5.2 innings, gave up four earned runs. So it has been a long while since Jamison Tyone has done anything productive as a starter. I mean, I'm trying to remember when the last time he got a win was. Right. And he he in, had that little know, streak, and that was against the in Mets. June. A little streak in June, maybe, or, or mid-July, something like that? End of Ju- yeah, mid to end July to early August. So he had a streak where he had four or five. He rattled off five wins in his six games, and that last win that he got came on August 8th. Yeah, well, so I'm not feeling really great about Friday's game then. How about uh, how about who the D-backs are going to throw at the Cubs? Yeah, this is not going to make you feel any better. Zach Gallion is going to be pitching for the D-backs. And, you know, the the D-backs have pitching, and that's that's really what kind of has me, like like I said, I, you know, this is a matchup that I just I'm not really looking forward to. Zach Gallion's 14-7 and seven with a 348 ERA. He lost his last game to Baltimore, five point, you know, one of the best teams in baseball, 5.1 innings, gave up five earned runs. He lost the game before that against the Dodgers, another good team, five-point innings. He gave up six earned runs. And then against Texas, he had a much better start. He went six innings. He only gave up one earned run with 11 Ks. So his last couple starts have been shaky, only 5.1 innings, gave up five, home run, five runs and six runs. So may, maybe the Cubs are catching him at a right time when their offense is hot. And, and he's kind of sl- uh, slowing down a little bit. No, we can only hope. All right, game number three, Saturday, Cubs ace, Justin Steele. Yes, sir. What, what You know, Cy Young candidate, we were mentioning it, number two in the bets right there. 16 wins, three losses, 255 ERA. Magnificent, magnificent against the Giants, eight innings, zero earned runs. Against Milwaukee, six innings, zero earned runs. And against Pittsburgh, six innings, two runs. So this guy has just been absolutely lights out. This is going to be, I think, game three. That's the pitch. Like, if, if you're just a baseball fan, this is the one that you want to circle as far as pitching matchups. Um, the Diamondbacks are going to throw Merrill Kelly up against him. And so I think that's that's going to be a very exciting game. He's 11 and uh, 11 and 6 right now with a 322 ERA. In his last start, he won he, against Colorado. Seven innings, gave up only one earned run. Against the Dodgers, though, he struggled mightily. They got pounded by the Dodgers. Um, he gave up uh, seven earned runs, 12 hits, a five innings pitch. But then he did really good against Cincinnati the start before that. Seven innings, zero earned runs. So I don't, I'm trying to wonder, you know, like I said, uh, you know, you know, we don't know everything about Arizona, but it looked like that Dodgers series was really brutal for him. All right, let's hope that continues. Game number four, this is going to be Sunday. Kyle Hendricks, Dr. Beeper on the Hill. Yeah, with Kyle Hendricks, like I said, I'm okay with him as long as the wind is not blowing out. That just, like I said, you know, if and that's the same thing with Tyone as well. But Hendricks, five and seven, three seventy three ERA, so that ERA is still good against the Giants. I saw him, you know, like I said, wind dated home run. One of them was unearned. He gave up seven hits, four earned runs against Milwaukee. Six innings, gave up four hits, zero earned runs, and against Pittsburgh, five point two innings, gave up only two earned runs. So I mean, even with that San Fran start, I watched it. It wasn't like he was pitching poorly. It just there's some some you know cheap home runs. There was a couple mistakes, and he just has got to get out of that first inning without yep. giving up a run. Yeah. What would you think? Any any would you think about an opener for him? Like somebody no. come out in the first inning, and then you bring in Kyle Hendricks? No way. No, no, no. But Kyle's well established. He's a guy that's very very routine oriented. I I'm not messing with that right now. I don't think there's anything you could really do other than just wait for this guy to kind of get into his rhythm. All right, Crowley, let's get into the hots and the knots. Okie dokie. With the hots right now, I mean, we kind of mentioned it before that uh, Seiya Suzuki is super red hot right now. He's 13 for his last 29 with three home runs, 10 RBIs. He is slashing a 448, 484, 931 slug. Unbelievable. Uh, Cody Bellinger, 11 for his last 29. 
with a double, four home runs, nine RBIs. He's slashing 379, 406, and 828. So those guys are absolutely mashing right now. Oh, yeah. Fantastic ball players. Fantastic right now. And, and, you know, we gave Ian Happ, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we were frustrated. He's now eight for his last 26 with three doubles, one home run, and seven RBIs. And he only he has zero strikeout. He doesn't strike out a lot, but, you know, he's slashing 308, 406, 528. So he's another guy that's hot. Yeah, he could be on the list. Let's hope when we get back here uh, after the Diamondback series. All right, who do we have to watch out for as Cub fans, Crowley? Who, is the, who are some of the hot guys for the uh, Diamondbacks? Ah, uh, yeah, real quick, just Christopher Morrell and Heimer Candelario are pulling up the not list right now. I was trying to stay positive, Crowley. I was trying to stay positive. <laughs> the Cubs are, you know, a game and a half out of first place. Come on. I Let's just want to talk see about the, the knots. I mean, after Christopher Morrell hit that shot last night, it's uh, we're disrespecting him. I would like to see Candelario get out here, but but see, here's the thing with Morrell. It's, it's interesting to see now, but you know, every now and then he can start getting on one of those hot streaks too. So you know, but but Heimer is a guy that I really want to see kind of come back and, and start to play a little bit uh, better and help the team out. But again, when you got three guys that are hot right now, and you can put Jan Gomes in that category, the knots don't hurt you as bad. Right. Absolutely. All right. Let's get into the Diamondbacks. Who who are guys that we need to watch out for as Cub fans over the next four games? You know, Kettle Marte, he's a great hitter, six for his last 15. Um, zero home runs, two RBIs, but he's slashing 400, 438, 667. Christian Walker, their first baseman, six for his last 15 with two home runs and th- three RBIs, uh, 400, 436, 800. Also look out for Lourdes Gurriel. Um, mm. He is five for his last 17, two home runs and three RBIs. So Walker and Gurriel are the ones providing the power. Um, Tommy Pham and Alex Thomas are not doing much as far as outfielder concerned. They're both two for their last 16 with no home runs and only one RBI. Well, let's hope that continues. All right, Crowley, prediction time. Uh, four games set. I know you hate those, but it's four games. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Diamondbacks at Wrigley Field. Yeah, there's a TBD in there. I'm, I'm going to go with the Cubs taking three of four. Obviously, I don't like game two at the Jamison Tyone. Assad versus TBD after after they had to fly all night. I'll take that. I like Justin Steele over Merrill Kelly. That'll be fun. And then I think Kyle Hendricks will b- beat Brandon Perfed who's one and eight with the six twenty seven ERA. Yep. I am with you three out of four. I won't get greedy. It's the uh, tie own game that the Cubs will drop over the next four. Uh, that's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download review and subscribe to the fly, the W podcast. Follow us on the socials, Facebook, Instagram. And also don't forget, you can email us fly the W six seventy gmail.com chat with us. And now watch us on YouTube by subscribing to the six seventy the score YouTube channel. Crowley, enjoy the games. I know you'll also be tuned in. It's week one of the NFL season. I know you're all pumped up about that. Um, yeah. So I'll have to have two monitors going during the uh, Bears game and the Cubs game. Unfortunately, I think the uh, Cubs are playing earlier. Bears kick off a little bit after three on Sunday. Um, have a great weekend, and uh, you know what to say. Yeah, make sure, Cub fans, you're following my social at Crowley's Cubs. I will be at the games Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so I will be there and I will have all the Hall of Fame stuff for the next time we meet. And this whole weekend, I'll be cheering, Go Cubs! Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!